this video talks about the ARCH1 model. The ARCH1 parameterization of the variance is the simplest and maybe also most useful parameterization. Learning points from the ARCH1 do carry over to more complex ARCH gauge models. I therefore take the stand that our intuition benefits from knowing the ARCH1 model inside out. And with this video, I want to address the following topics. First, how does the parameterization of an ARCH1 look like? Second, I want to derive the expectation, variance and kurtosis of ARCH1 errors. And third, I want to see that, or I want you to see, that for capturing fat tails in returns, you will have to restrict the parameter space, which can limit the usefulness of more complex arch gauge models. So in order to introduce the arch one model, I want to remind you of our basic return decomposition, which I'm restating here. Now it says that we can decompose realized time t returns into an ex ante expectation, which is mu t minus one, it's just the expectation of RT as of time t minus one and into a statistical return innovation epsilon t. And that innovation is thought of to be the product of an FT minus one measurable volatility sigma t minus one and a fundamental innovation eta t. So let's turn to point number one. An arch one model assumes the following parameterization for the conditional variance of prediction errors. Where in the unconstrained form, the parameters of alpha zero and alpha one have to fulfill the restrictions that alpha zero is positive and alpha one is zero or positive. Now looking at the arch one parameterization, you notice two things. On the one hand, return variance is assumed to be rising linearly in the most recent statistical return shock. So if the last return shock was large, you assume that the probability of observing another large return shock is increasing. On the other hand, if you set alpha zero to zero and alpha one to one, you end up with the expression that sigma square t minus one equals epsilon squared t minus one. Now I like that expression because it highlights that assuming variance to coincide with squared residuals is consistent with a special arch one model. And remember, the tests for detecting arch effects worked with the time series of squared residuals as a proxy for variance. So here you see basically why that has been a good idea. Now let's turn to our second objective, the derivation of the first, second and fourth moment. Note, the arch one model is symmetric and does therefore come along with a zero skewness. But as we see shortly, an arch one can account for fat tails or excess kurtosis. I want to show you that the first moment of an arch one random variable is zero. I also want to show you that the variance of an arch one model equals alpha zero divided by one minus alpha one. And if you look at that expression, you also note that the alpha one needs to be further restricted as alpha one cannot be one or larger. Otherwise, you won't have a finite variance. Now I also want to show you that the kurtosis equals the following expression. Looking at the kurtosis highlights that the arch one captures excess kurtosis or fat tails, meaning it has a kurtosis of larger than three if the following restriction on alpha one holds. The more complex the arch models, the more parameter restrictions you end up with and the less convenient it will be 
to actually work with Arch models in practical applications. One way to overcome this issue is to work with gauge models or with stochastic volatility models. Now the rest of the video is on algebra. I will take the time to show you how to compute the above mentioned quantities. If your goal is to really understand how Arch1 dynamics work, I recommend you go through the derivations. Otherwise, you can turn off the video now and enjoy your free time. So first, I show that the unconditional mean of an Arch1 shark is zero. The typical trick is to use the law of iterated expectations. That means you write the unconditional expectation as the unconditional expectation of a conditional expectation. Now here's the math equation. On the left hand side you see you have the unconditional expectation of epsilon t. Now that equals the unconditional expectation of the conditional expectation of epsilon t, where you condition on t minus 1. You, you do that because now you rewrite the epsilon t by arch1 assumption as sigma t minus 1 times the eta t. Since you have to evaluate the conditional expectation of epsilon t, you end up with the unconditional expectation of the product of sigma t minus 1 times the conditional expectation of eta t as of t minus 1. Note here the sigma t minus 1 is measurable as of t minus 1, so I can put that out of the conditional operator. Now, the conditional expectation of eta is zero, and therefore the entire product is zero. So I found what I wanted to find, that the unconditional expectation of an arch one shock is zero. Now let's move on to the variance. And we use the trick that epsilon t is a stationary random variable. Now therefore it holds that the expectation of sigma squared t minus 1 needs to be the expectation of sigma squared t minus 2, needs to be the expectation of sigma squared t. Right? So the unconditional moment of these quantities, they all need to be the same. So let's start to go for the unconditional variance. So here we write, the variance of epsilon t is simply the second moment of epsilon t because epsilon is a, mirror, is a mean zero process. The next thing we do is we use the law of iterated expectations and we write epsilon as the product of sigma times the eta. And now that's the equation you end up with. And again, you see why we do that, because the sigma squared t minus one is measurable as of time t minus one. So it goes out of the conditional expectation operator and second, the conditional expectation of eta t square is simply 1. And therefore we found an intermediate result, which is that the variance of epsilon t is the expectation of sigma squared t minus 1. Here's what we do next. We now plug in the arch1 parameterization into the last equation and take the constants out of the expectation operator. So it means the expectation of sigma squared t minus 1 by arch1 assumption is simply alpha 0 plus alpha 1 times the expectation of epsilon squared t minus 1. Now we use again the law of iterated expectations and we are rewriting epsilon t minus 1 by its parameterization to coincide with sigma times the eta. And we end up with that second equation here. Now again, note the conditional expectation of eta squared t minus 1, conditional on t minus 2, is 1. And therefore, we just derive that the expectation of sigma squared t minus 1 equals alpha 0 plus alpha 1 times the expectation of sigma squared t minus 2. And now here we use the stationarity of epsilon. 
which implies that the expectation of sigma square t minus 1 needs to be the same than the expectation of sigma square t minus 2. We combine that with the previous insight that we derived that the expectation of sigma square t minus 1 is simply equal to the variance of epsilon t. We therefore rewrite that last equation as the variance of epsilon t equals alpha 0 plus alpha 1 times the variance of epsilon t. And now we solve for epsilon t and you see it coincides with alpha 0 divided by 1 minus alpha 1. So let's move on to the kurtosis. Kurtosis is defined as the fourth moment divided by the squared second moment. So we've just determined the squared second moment. That's the one we have to determine because the squared second moment or the second moment was just determined and now we go for the fourth moment. So again we will rely on the law of iterated expectations and of the concept of stationarity. So we compute first the conditional fourth moment expressed in the next equation. Now sigma t minus 1 to the power of 4 is measurable as of t minus 1 so we put that outside of the expectation operator and we end up with the expectation of epsilon to the power of 4 in time t, conditional on t minus 1, is sigma to the power of 4 t minus 1 times the conditional expectation of eta t to the power of 4. Now, in order to compute now the fourth moment of the fundamental short eta t, we need to know which statistical distribution does eta follow. As of now, we just assume that eta is an IID 0, 1 process. Now that leaves the fourth moment unspecified as we only made an assumption on the first and second moment. Therefore, we need an additional assumption. Now here for the exercise, we assume that eta is a Gaussian N0, 1 process. It's known that the fourth moment of a standardized Gaussian random variable is 3. And hence, going back to our last equation, we can therefore continue to say the conditional expectation of the fourth moment of epsilon is simply 3 times the volatility as of t minus 1 to the power of 4. So now we plug in the parametric arch 1 structure for sigma to the power of 4. Now that gives us that the conditional fourth moment of epsilon is simply three times, and now we have alpha zero plus alpha one epsilon square t minus one to the power of two. So next we multiply out the square terms and we get the following expression. Now we use the law of iterated expectations to state that the unconditional fourth moment is simply a function of the conditional fourth moment. I'm highlighting that now mathematically in this next equation. So what we now do is we plug the parametric expression for the conditional fourth moment into that last equation and put all the constants out of the expectation operator. So what we end up with is that the unconditional fourth moment of epsilon is three times, you know, alpha zero square plus two alpha zero alpha one times the unconditional second moment of epsilon plus alpha one square times the unconditional fourth moment. Note the unconditional second moment of epsilon was previously determined. It equals alpha zero divided by one minus alpha one. So we plug that in and regroup terms and come to this next equation. What we now do is we rewrite the right hand side with one denominator and group terms. 
And that gives us the next expression. And that expression we also rewrite in a nicer form so that we get the following equality. So the last we now do is we solve explicitly for the unconditional fourth moment of epsilon and that gives us it coincides with 3 alpha 0 to the power of 2 divided by 1 minus 3 alpha 1 square times the ratio of 1 plus alpha 1 over 1 minus alpha 1. Okay, so we found the fourth moment and we now have everything at hand to get the unconditional kurtosis. So we now simply plug in the unconditional second and fourth moment into the definition of kurtosis. So the kurtosis is defined as the unconditional fourth moment over the variance to the power of two. So we plug in the previous results and we get the following equation. Now we regroup terms a little bit and we are getting that the kurtosis is three times the ratio of one minus alpha one square over one minus three alpha one square. So after all that algebra, you've learned that the arch one parameterization accounts for excess kurtosis, which means a kurtosis that exceeds the Gaussian kurtosis of three if the following parameter restrictions hold, meaning the kurtosis of an arch one model is above three, if alpha one square is positive or zero, but less than one third. Now that tells us that if you estimate an arch one model for residuals, the model has a finite unconditional variance and fat tails if the estimated alpha one coefficient is in the range of alpha one being below one and alpha one square being below one third but positive or zero. So you either have to run a constrained estimation or you hope for the best. But now in all seriousness, you see from that simple arch model that these parameter restrictions could become an obstacle for more complicated arch models and for the data that you're working with. So the way around that obstacle is to either use gauge models or stochastic volatility models.